A uh, few opening remarks here. My name is Matt Raby. I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service out of the Nebraska Ecological Services Field Office. And we're located over at the Crane Trust Complex uh, at Wood, Wood River, Nebraska. Um, we're going to go ahead and hold off initially on, on questions uh, after each of the speakers. There is an opportunity to um, input your questions into the, the online app. And that's going to be the easiest for me to get back to them after we finish up with our four speakers. And uh, depending on how much time we have at that point, we'll be able to go through those and any in-person questions we have right here. Uh, first speaker we have up is Abraham Kantz, graduate student in Oklahoma State University. And he's going to be given a presentation on the influence of management and environmental factors on below ground invertebrate and vegetation communities in wet meadows along the Platte River. It's a mouthful of a title. All right, well thanks for that intro, Matt. Uh, I wanna start with thank yous real quick. So a number of organizations are represented right here in this room uh, uh, and they've let me come onto their property to sample some of these wet meadows. In addition to those uh, conservation organizations, just thanking my advisors, committee members, uh, technicians that have helped me. Uh, what I'm going to be presenting today is actually just the first chapter of data that's been collected over three summers of field work. And so uh, what I want to talk about first with this is just get everyone on the same page with what wet meadows are. So wet meadows are kind of wetland, so they're going to have uh, saturated soils and maybe even standing water for a portion of the year. Typically for wet meadows we see for a couple months out of the year. In wet meadows, they have carex-dominated vegetative communities. So that's kind of a baseline uh, of what wet meadows are. You can think of them as sort of between a more upland site and a shallow marsh, both physically in terms of elevation and kind of ecologically to some degree. Shallow marsh having much deeper water, cattails, things like that, and uplands not having any of those hydric soil features you would expect in wetlands. Uh, wet meadows provide a number of ecosystem services. Uh, they're critical in the processing of nutrients, uh, nitrogen, and holding of carbon. They can serve as really good, uh, uh, they are sometimes, oftentimes the first place to flood when there are high waters, so they can protect the surrounding area. They're also really good foraging habitat, um, and in particular, uh, they're good foraging habitat and stopover habitat for migratory birds, as we know around here. Um, the sandhill cranes that come through, as well as whooping cranes, uh, shorebirds, and other kinds of birds that migrate through the area. Now this picture often does a lot better um, when I'm presenting in Oklahoma, where they don't see this natural wonder every year, so they're a bit more, so if you guys wanna do some oohs and ahs from the audience, that would help me with my self-esteem. All right, perfect, right, it's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Huh? No, no, I did not. Um, that I got, sorry, I should say, I got that from the, uh, the Crane Trust website, and I think I, on the slideshow in the comments, I have who did it, but I have no screen here, but I can get you who took the photo. I should have put it just directly on there. Um, we all were just at lunch, so we had a good overview of the history of the Central Platte River Valley, but just to go over that a bit more, there's been a, a long history of anthropogenic influence. Uh, so the inputs of dams, diversions, use of groundwater, and things like that. And this has kind of shifted the river morphology into more of a, uh, a tree-dominated uh, sort of floodplain, um, and more of a braided river that we see nowadays. And wet meadows associated with the Platte River um, are in decline due to these modifications. It's not all doom and gloom, though, for the Platte River. Uh, restoration efforts have been underway, as many of you know, for the pa over 40 years. Um, these efforts are the federal, state, and uh, private organizations. And they can consist of a number of things when uh, uh, restoring wet meadows. You can do some recontouring of the land to try to mimic slough hydrology, which is a very difficult task. Uh, tree clearing is a very common kind of restoration effort. And then just reseeding of sites even can be considered a restoration effort for uh, uh, these sites. So with some of that background knowledge on the Platte River and uh, some knowledge of what wet meadows are, I wanted to get more into my project. So as I said, this is kind of the culmination of uh, three summers of field work, and my objectives for this first part 
are to examine the effects of current hydrology. So uh, studies uh, similar to mine examining the macroinvertebrate communities of uh, wet meadows in the central Platte River Valley haven't been conducted since about uh, the uh, early 2000s. And so this is kind of an update. Um, that was before you know, uh, uh, PRIP was active and things like that. So now that we're uh, doing more management in the area, we want to see how that has influenced these wet meadows. We also want to document relationships uh, so just looking at relationships between wet meadow vegetation as well as the macroinvertebrate communities and uh, soil quality, things like that. And then establish restoration targets. And this is kind of the big uh, culmination of all the research is try to give us something to aim for when we're restoring these sites and trying to get wet meadows back. So one question that may be on people's minds is why use macroinvertebrates for this? Why use them as, uh, uh, for, for this purpose, for setting targets and, what, and whatnot? Well, macroinvertebrates are really good bioindicators. They're used in a number of ecosystems uh, and, and used quite often in freshwater ecosystems in particular. Uh, and they're also critical to the ecosystem. They're critical in the processing of the nitrogen and carbon, a lot of chemical processes within the soils of these wet meadows and uh, critical as a food source for uh, the migratory birds, specifically cranes that come through the area. And so uh, cranes, uh, while uh, by volume, uh, macroinvertebrates only make up about 10% of a, uh, a crane's stomach contents, uh, in terms of the foraging time, they will spend greater than 50% of their time uh, foraging for these macroinvertebrates in these wet meadows. So they're spending a disproportionate amount of time foraging for what is rel a relatively small portion of their diet. So there has to be some nutritional value that they're getting out of these macroinvertebrates for them to want to input that much effort. And then, of course, macroinvertebrates are also utilized by the uh, waterfowl and shorebirds that come through here in addition to the cranes. So, my, uh, you're all very familiar with this area. My uh, study sites range from east of Kearney all the way to uh, a bit, w uh, sorry, west of Kearney, all the way to a bit east of Grand Island. Um, and I had 79 total sites. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on 54 of those sites. So, the breakdown for my sites was we had 54 what we called remnant sites, so sites that had historically been wet meadows and continue to be wet meadows. Uh, 11... Uh, uh, restored sites, and then 12 reconstructed sites. And so for the first chapter, we're focusing specifically on the relic sites. So talking about the methods real quick, we decided on our, on our wet meadow sites based on USDA soil maps, as well as uh, flooding frequency maps. And this is just a, a kind of a good picture. It's hard to see some of the, the uh, transects out there, but if you look on the sides of the photo, you can see these yellow lines. Those are 100 meter transects that we would put out to sample along for macroinvertebrates, as well as doing sampling for the uh, vegetation. While we were at these sites, we would collect a lot of data. So we have a really rich data set from uh, this project. So we'd of course do coordinates, things like that. Uh, below ground macroinvertebrates were collected by uh, digging a block of soil out of the ground that was 25 by 25 by 20 centimeters, so a good chunk of soil, and we'd just toss that in a bag, take it back to the lab and rinse through it, pulling out all the macroinvertebrates. We would take those samples every 20 meters along the 100 meter transect, starting at meter zero, so six total samples at the site. On top of that, we would look at soil moisture because that can be heavily influential on the uh, macroinvertebrate community. Bulk density, that influences macroinvertebrate movement as well as the growth of, of roots uh, for the vegetative community. Uh, root density itself, and then uh, depth to water at the site, so seeing how well they are connected to that groundwater table. In addition, we did some, uh, some in-field tests, some squeeze and ribbon tests and, uh, for things like soil organic matter and clay content, and then we took samples that we sent off to the Oklahoma State University Soil Testing Lab for a battery of tests, which I actually just got the results back from and started analyzing this last week. So uh, they won't be in this presentation, unfortunately. Didn't get them in time, but you can look forward to seeing some of those in the future. And then for the vegetative community, we uh, used that data mostly to calculate flor floristic quality index and wetland indicator scores, which is a, a weighted score based on the, uh, uh, essentially, uh, the uh, finding a, a plant within, what is it? a weighted score based on the likelihood of a plant or uh, where plants want to be growing, whether it's in a wetter habitat, uh, facilitated, uh, yeah, 
So this is a good picture of what happens at a site. So you can see the macroinvertebrate block, um, kind of a big block we dig out there, and then you have bulk density, and you have the root density samples. We just toss those in trash bags. We'll pick them up, take them back to the lab for processing later. OK, so you're all up to date on uh, what my process was, and I want to talk some about the results while I still have some time left. <laughs> Uh, so we found 58 uh, total unique uh, invertebrate taxa, and we ID'd them at least a family. Three most common taxa were Aparectidea, which are uh, an invasive species of, uh, invasive genus, excuse me, of earthworm. Diplocardia, which is our native earthworms. And then Armadilla diadei, which are like your pill bugs, your isopods. Breaking that down further into uh, specifically the uh, earthworms versus the arthropods in the earthworm community, uh, you can see that we find the invasive earthworms, Aparectidea, at about twice the rate that we found uh, Diplocardia at these sites. And then for the arthropod community, I put the five highest, uh, five, uh, yeah, five uh, highest found communities within our sites. So you have Armadilla diadei, again, which are our pill bugs, Formicidae, our ants, Scarabaeidae, which would uh, be your scarab beetles, consisting of things like June bugs and dung beetles. Elateridae are your click beetles, and then Tepulidae are your crane flies. And so what I'm doing with this data is I'm then relating it to a, a number of those environmental variables that we collected data on. And this slide right here is a little scary to look at. And so we're gonna break it down together really quick. So what this is, is this is a kind of ordination called a conditional coordinate analysis. Essentially what's happening here, let's direct our attention towards uh, the x-axis first. This axis is a culmination of a couple of different variables. So here, this axis represents changes in elevation, hydrology, and vegetation. And it describes 24.5% of the variation we see within uh, the community of uh, invertebrates we've collected. The y-axis here is conductivity, soil organic matter, and year, explaining about 20.3% of the variability in the macroinvertebrates that I sampled. Now, how you would read this is you could look at things like Tepulidae up here, and then you can see uh, lines that, are, that follow a similar trend to it. Uh, in this case, actually, it correlates really well with weighted wetland indicator score, but negatively. So a positive correlation would be going positively with this line, a negative correlation is here. So as the weighted wetland indicator score decreases, you get wetter, you find more of these. Um, a similar thing, uh, you have Diplocardia over here, so there's a, there's a positive correlation between Diplocardia and elevation. Uh, one thing to note is when you have lines like the grazing score right here, which is a score we took at each site from zero to five based on a visual assessment of uh, the vegetation, uh, if it's between the two axes, kind of at this 45 degree angle, it doesn't correlate well with either axis, so we're not explaining a lot with that variable. So that's not all my analysis, though. Essentially, what we did is I, I used that to inform some modeling that I later did. In this case, I used that to inform Bayesian, uh, some Bayesian generalized linear models I created, um, looking at a, at a couple of these communities. And I want to show you some of those results right now, just a couple. We're not going to go through all of them. So uh, first, the Tepulidae. Uh, you can see that they had a positive correlation with the floristic quality index. So as kind of the quality of vegetation improved, we saw an increase in the number of Tepulidae present at our sites. And uh, these correlations I'm showing you um, from the Bayesian generalized linear models are all uh, greater than 99% probability of direction, which you can kind of uh, think of similarly to a, a p-value. They aren't the same thing, but you can think of it in a similar way for this uh, analysis. And then I chose box plots here because uh, while there is overlap, right, all these go to zero, you, I'm showing a distribution at each of these values. And you want to have zero still in that distribution because there's always a chance you don't find these individuals at a site. Uh, so here, for the second variable in this model, which is the, uh, which, uh, the, model, uh, the model for uh, Tepulidae, you can see that we have a positive correlation between conductivity and to pulidate abundance again. And so conductivity correlates really well with the uh, amount of water at a site within the soil, as well as the solutes present within that soil. It has a lot to do with the, the mineral structure of the soil. So as things get wetter, and we're not exactly sure what minerals are changing in there, but there's something going on, increasing conductivity, we see more to pulidate. 
And so the best model in a, uh, of the bivariate models I created was this model that included fluoristic quality index and conductivity. Uh, next community I want to talk about real quick was uh, Armadillo Diade, your pill bugs. So we can, it, this is an interesting one because, uh, so you can see a positive correlation with the longitude here. And someone had pointed out uh, at the last time I presented this that this might actually, uh, there might be a gradient of species along this as well, but I, have, I haven't identified Armadillo Diade down to species, but it's something to look into in the future definitely. So essentially, as, here, as we're moving further east, we're seeing an increase in uh, the armadillo diadae abundance. And then with richness, actually, we're seeing a decrease as the vegetation becomes more rich at these sites. Uh, next, I want to talk about the earthworm communities. So Diplocardia, in this case, we see a positive correlation between spring depth to water and the uh, uh, Diplocardia abundance, so they like the wetter areas. That makes sense for the earthworms. And actually, the next best variable for describing uh, Diplocardia was the Aperectidae abundance in terms of the modeling, which is interesting to think about because the Aperectidae are an invasive variety of earthworm. However, previous research has shown or has, has, uh, has kind of demonstrated that there might be some partitioning of resources between the invasive earthworms and the native earthworms. And while the invasive earthworms can change soil structure and it influences plants and other macroinvertebrates, the coexistence of Diplocardia and Aperactidae is uh, relatively normal in a lot of these sites. Moving on to the Aperectidae now, the invasive earthworms. Again, we, uh, we see that, uh, here we see that as depth to water increases, so it gets a bit drier, we're seeing an increase in Aperectidae abundance. And then Diplocardia was the uh, second best predictor for Aperectidae uh, abundance. So again, we're seeing those communities are really closely tied to one another, which is interesting uh, when we're talking about this invasive species. Ooh, there we go. So that's a lot of figures. I'm sorry I just put you all through seeing all of those. But uh, essentially what we want to do is we want to take these relationships that I've started to uh, refine and we want to eventually uh, further refine them and get them to a point where we can use them to better assess wet meadow ecosystems and then kind of give those to managers and allow them to, to uh, establish targets or goals for uh, management of these sites. And so in summary, we've completed data collection from three summers. I've conducted an ordination type analysis, a conditional coordinate analysis, and then I've started some predictive modeling. And we're going to continue refining these models uh, and trying to get a better idea of what's going on in these wet meadow systems. And we won't do questions, so that slide doesn't exist. All right. <laughs> All right, thanks, Abe. Next up, we've got Kristen Cognac, hydrogeologist, Headwaters Corporation. And Kristen will be giving us a presentation on quantifying the hydrologic constraints on a wet meadow restoration along the Central Platte River in Nebraska. Thank you. Um, my presentation should be a pretty good follow-up to that last one. So hi everyone, my name is Kristen Cognac. I work for Headwaters Corporation um, in support of the Platte River Recovery Implementation Program. And today I'm going to be talking about quantifying hydrologic constraints for wet meadows along the Central Platte River. And I have to see my slides, so maybe I'm gonna go like this. So you just got a great primer on wet meadows. A lot of people here probably already know what they are as well, but wet meadows are ephemeral wetlands and grasslands. They exhibit a shallow water table and standing water for part of the year. And they're characterized by high spatio-temporal variability, which these time-lapse images from a Brindley Buckley et al. publication in 2021 are really exemplifying. So you can see different hydrologic conditions in different locations, both throughout a given year and also between years at the same time. And the vegetation, river, and groundwater are tightly linked at wet meadow sites. So there's a, a high hydraulic connection between the river and the wet meadow, and that hydrology influences vegetation strongly. And as you just heard, Wet meadows provide various ecological, sorry, important ecological resources, and there have been significant declines in wet meadows due to human development, and there's been a long recognized need to restore and protect wet meadow sites. 
Am I shouting into the microphone or just, okay, great. And although there have been many existing studies at wet meadow sites, you just heard about some of them related to macroinvertebrates um, and hydrology and all these other things, there's still a lot of unknowns that limit our ability to manage and restore wet meadows. And in particular, there's still unknowns related to the role of hydrology in supporting wet meadows. And um, some of the questions that we wanted to address were actually very similar to Abraham's questions, but just in a different way. So what are ideal hydrologic conditions at wet meadow sites? Can we quantify whether hydrology is limiting the health or restoration success of wet meadows? And also, can we manage sites differently with respect to hydrology? And before I dive into my study, I also want to point out that a lot of sites that have been chosen for restoration were previously converted to croplands. So you can see this image here on the left. It actually probably was converted to croplands even in the image to the left, but it's just a little less obvious. You can kind of see a center pivot line there. But um, conversion to croplands typically includes draining and ditching of sites, and it can um, result in leveling the topography, uh, which can result in really important changes in soil moisture and drainage conditions. And so I'm not really looking at that, but studies like Abraham's, I'm sure, consider stuff like that. And uh, um, it's also important to consider wet meadows in the broader context of the Platte River system, and which we've been hearing a lot about since we've been here. Um, but there have been significant changes in discharge and sediment transport along the Platte River, so reductions in peak flows and reductions in sediment transport, particularly on some reaches. And this has led to channel narrowing, vegetation encroachment, and incision. And all of these things have the uh, potential to impact wet meadow hydrology. And even though I'm not specifically reconstructing past wet meadow hydrology, um, I made this little conceptual figure to just think about why it might be difficult to restore a wet meadow site that has undergone some of these changes. So with narrowing and incision, you can see there's a decrease in the channel elevation, and that can propagate into the wet meadow groundwater levels, and that's how there's a potential to impact wet meadow hydrology. So just because a site historically was a great wet meadow, it doesn't mean that the conditions exist today for it to still be a great wet meadow. So for our study, we looked at two sites. Um, shown here on the left is the Fox site. This is a restored, formerly cropland wet meadow site. It's managed as a wet meadow today. There are actually some, there's been some recontouring at the site and reseeding uh, and re seeding, not, not, yeah, okay, I think you know what I mean. Um, and our second site is what I'll refer to as the Binfield site. That's a native wet meadow, so it hasn't been used for other purposes during its site history. And from each of these sites, we have over eight years of hourly groundwater, surface water, and weather data. And so these white dots indicate the well locations, uh, monitoring, groundwater monitoring wells, and that's the primary data that I'll be using in the subsequent analyses. So one of the first things we did was we extracted a bunch of area-based groundwater depth statistics from our two wet meadow sites to characterize the hydrology. And it's important to note here that these area-based measurements are actually really helpful for capturing that spatiotemporal variability that I mentioned earlier, stuff that you can't just do with point measurements uh, or even transect measurements. And so we can pull that data and analyze it, and right away we can see, even just between our two sites, there are significant hydrologic differences. So the statistic I've pulled here is that at the Fox site, which is that restored site, um, we can see 15% of the site area has median water levels within 0.6 meters of the surface, Whereas at our Binfield site, 73% of the site has median water levels um, for the study period within 0.6 meters of the surface. And um, so we know our Binfield site is wetter, but it's also, we're lucky, there was a previous study in 1994 by Wesch et al. that 
manually um, collected similar data. Uh, their coverage wasn't as spatio-temporally high in resolution, but they were able to pull some, some similar depth statistics. And um, we can see, and I should also mention, their study period was a different period in time. There could be different hydrologic conditions, and theirs was a four-year study period. Ours was eight years. But we can, we can see that there's a range in variability in that statistic that I pulled earlier of the area of the site that has those shallow groundwater levels. And we can also, interestingly, see um, a trend going from west to east, which may just be by chance in the sites that we picked, something that we might consider a little bit further. But I think this really highlights that there's a lot of variability um, across wet meadow sites uh, as we start to collect more data and characterize more sites. And so the next thing we wanted to do was to link groundwater depths to vegetation, because that's one of the things that we really care about at wet meadow sites. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so um, a Henze et al. study from 2004 identified four key wet meadow vegetation groups that exist along a topographic and resulting moisture gradient at wet meadow sites. So in the low areas, you get your emergent wetland vegetation. Um, and as you go higher and theoretically move away from the water table at a, any given water table, you go through sedge meadow, mesic prairie, and dry ridge vegetation groups. And those two are different colors. They don't look like it from my angle. I don't know if they look like it from yours, but OK, great. Um, and what Henze and, all, Henze and all did was they um, tested a bunch of different depth to water statistics to see what was the best predictor of each vegetation group and developed some nonlinear models. And they came up with this best predictor statistic, which is the grow in, growing season, seven day moving average high water level. <clears throat> I wish I brought water. And uh, I'll call this statistics the L7. That's kind of hard to say, but basically if you took the moving average, the seven day moving average of the water level and recorded the annual highest water table, that's your number. So we took our data from our wet meadow sites and we converted that, our daily water table map, to a seven day moving average. And then for each location on that grid cell, we can pull the maximum for the growing season to get the L7 of an entire site. And then we can start to predict percentages of which vegetation group would exist based on the hydrology. And from that, we can uh, do that for both of our sites for all, oh, thank you so much, uh, for each year. Wow, that was so kind. And uh, <clears throat> we can um, immediately see differences between our two sites. So at the top we have Binfield that's largely sedge meadow, a little bit of emergent, and then Mesic Prairie. And then our Fox site on, on the bottom here, um, which is primarily Mesic Prairie, also um, some sedge meadow, but quite a bit of dry ridge. And uh, um, we can pull those statistics and start to get a better picture of what types of vegetation we expect to see at wet, wet meadow sites and compare our sites. And then also, I'm going to skip these little boxes. Um, we can start to translate those findings into management actions or objectives. So in this case, <coughs> Oops, sorry. We can take our two sites and, or we can look at the Fox site, um, which in this case we, I should back up and say it's really important to have that wet, uh, the emergent wetland and um, sedge meadow vegetation. That's kind of key for wet meadow sites. And so we can look at the Fox site and say, we really want to see more of that predicted for it to look more like the Binfield site. Um, and in this case, if we were to raise the L7 by one meter, we, which is shown here on the right for Fox, we have maybe a more favorable looking site in terms of wet meadow conditions. And then we can say, okay, well, in a given year, if we wanted to raise the L7, um, what would that actually take in, turn of, in terms of management? And um, I'm not suggesting that we use water to raise water levels at wet meadow sites, but using even just a simple model, we can do scenario testing. And in this case, if we wanted to raise, raise stage 
to improve the groundwater levels at wet meadow sites, we actually would have to put really unrealistic uh, environmental flow releases into the channel. So we can start to learn things uh, about managing wet meadow sites without actually having to do them. Um, we can also test other strategies like adding surface recharge and we can get to more and more complex modeling depending what our needs are, but in this case this is quite simple and useful. We also, um, one of our objectives is to be able to extrapolate our results to other sites and not all sites have eight years of hydrologic data with high spatiotemporal coverage. So we're starting to look at ways that we might be able to predict whether a site is gonna have good hydrology for supporting a wet meadow um, and, and also for comparing sites. And so we know that the river groundwater connection is really strong. Stage is a predominant control on water levels at wet meadow sites. So we said, well, what if we took a, um, in this case, a modeled river flow surface. So we have these 2D hydrologic models just sitting on our server at work. And I pulled one of them and I extended the river surface. At this case, it was a 750 CFS flow. Um, I extended that river surface out into the floodplain and across the uh, riparian meadows or, or uh, islands, sorry, and I differenced it with the elevation. So I subtracted this river surface from the ground surface elevation. And what we're left with is this difference raster shown here on this figure. And we can see, and I'll zoom into the next slide quickly, when we compare those at the top, you have those elevation difference figures, and at the bottom, we have our L7 figures, and the scale might be a little bit different here in terms of, of the actual units, but we can relate units pretty easily. We can see that these figures look really similar, and so we might actually be able to use the river surface as a proxy. Oh, I just saw a sign in the back. Two minutes. Great. Um, and so uh, I think that we're developing maybe useful metrics that we can compare sites with um, that don't require intensive field data collection because it, the 90 mile habitat reach is quite large. And I'll also note here, um, and I'll do this going back a slide quickly, we can see that Crane Meadows is actually, is actually um, the blue indicates a ground surface that is below the river surface at this 750 CFS flow. We can see that Crane Meadows is actually in terms of these two islands, very wet and, and potentially an anomalously wet, wet meadow site. And so I think um, one other finding that we might have is that by being able to characterize lots of wet meadow sites, we can capture the full spectrum of hydrology and um, maybe define where the archetypal wet meadow lies within that spectrum. So to conclude, um, Wet meadow hydrology is highly spatio-temporally variable within and between sites. Improved hydrologic characterizations can inform management. Proxy data may be useful for selecting restoration sites and understanding hydrology. And archetypal wet meadows may fall somewhere between wet and dry end members. And moving forward, uh, we want to use our results to inform management decisions at wet meadow sites and to extrapolate extrapolate results to other sites. And thank you for listening, and if you have any questions, put them on the app. <laughs> thank you, Kristen. I think we're all getting pretty good at this now, and everyone knows what to do with questions and all that, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Got Mike Bullerman. Mike's going to be, uh, well, first, Mike's a restoration ecologist and GIS specialist with Prairie Plains Resource Institute. And Sarah Bailey uh, is also going to be helping out here. Uh, it's a greenhouse manager slash natural or naturalist educator with Prairie Plains Resource Institute. And they're going to be talking to us today about high diversity local ecotype prairie restoration methods. Our slides will be up soon here. <laughs> 
wrong. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, there we go. Sorry, learning how to work this. Um, so we just want to provide a, uh, the goal is to provide a quick overview of high diversity and local ecotype uh, prairie and wetland restoration techniques used by prairie plains uh, in central and eastern Nebraska. Um, and then also touch on why restoring native plant communities plays a vital role in ecosystem and specific species conservation efforts, uh, especially in the Platte River Valley. Um, so to begin with just a little bit of background on Prairie Plains. Um, so we work to connect people in prairies and to maintain uh, and restore prairie ecosystems in Nebraska. And this is accomplished through uh, our restoration work, uh, education efforts, and our network of eight different prairie preserves around the state of Nebraska. Um, so we are a nonprofit organization based in Aurora since 1980. And some of the first ecological restoration efforts uh, in Nebraska began in the 1980s through the efforts of uh, Bill and Jan Whitney and the founding of Prairie Plains. Um, Bill was inspired by the restoration efforts that he was seeing in uh, some of the Midwestern states like Illinois and Wisconsin. Um, and he brought some of those techniques and ideas and concepts back to Nebraska uh, and started looking at the native plant communities that we have uh, in, in the central and eastern regions in Nebraska and started to harvest seed. And so all of that, those efforts started small, um, but then in the 1990s grew uh, quite a bit as Prairie Plains began work through a cooperative uh, agreement um, to restore wet meadows along the Central Platte River Valley and has grown continuously since then. I uh, just want to go over some definitions, uh, again, relating to the ideas that Bill brought back from the East. Um, over time, the, we started calling it prairie restoration. Some people call it reconstruction, but it's the process of recreating a plant community, a native plant community, wetland or prairie, where one existed but is now gone. Um, we defined high diversity as a seed mix with uh, greater than 75 plant species in it and a local ecotype seed as being seed collected from wild populations of native plants that grow near a restoration site. Um, so I was going to quickly touch then too on um, the literature and in, in the support of uh, high diversity and local ecotype restoration work, uh, specifically with prairies and wetlands. So um, restoration projects using high diversity planting techniques develop native vegetation that more closely resembles remnant um, wet meadows and prairie and uh, from a study that was done uh, in the Central Platte Valley region from some of that work that began in the early 90s and into the mid 90s. Um, there's considerable evidence that more diverse seed mixes enhance grassland restoration success through increasing the seeded species richness, so the native uh, plants included in that mix, increasing the cover of the seeded species and reducing cover of exotic species and increasing the diversity of a seed mix is often uh, more important than actually uh, adding more seed uh, to that, that particular site. Um, restored prairie uh, surrounding remnant sites can protect native plant species richness within remnants, um, which is uh, very significant, especially in the, Platte, the central Platte River Valley um, because of the ability of some of these restored sites to uh, protect you know, that we've seen over time protecting some of the remnant sites um, as well. Um, restoration sites that develop diverse plant communities have the ability to support a wider diversity of insects and other wildlife. And then um, speaking to the local ecotype aspect of that, um, sourcing seed mixes for restoration projects um, that are more local or are from appropriate latitudes uh, may be beneficial to native pollinators and the developing plant communities by reducing the risk of phenological mismatch. Um, and that may be especially important for spring ephemeral species. Um, and that's a particular concern because as the, the mismatch, the phenological mismatch can limit their reproductive success and affect plant pollinator interactions over time. So over the last 40 years, it's, uh, and specifically the last 20 years, we've developed a database where we go to get this plant material. Um, those are GPS waypoints 
uh, about 12,000 of them representing 329 species, over 60 counties. Um, most of our plant material comes out of those road ditches. We also collect from uh, our own preserve system as well as uh, uh, cooperating agencies, lands, as well as um, private uh, properties. Um, we collect base, uh, usually around 225 to 250 species a year. And over, over the 40 years, we've gone from uh, a capacity of doing just a few acres to the ability to do about 1,000 acres a year. Um, going back to the definitions, this, the, the yellow polygon is, is our core collecting area. The green dots are our restoration sites and then the radii 100 and 150 miles out from that core collecting area. Just showing that we're, we're trying to stick to that definition of uh, local ecotype. Again, we've restored over 14,000 acres since 1979, 323 project sites in 60 counties, uh, pretty much throughout the eastern half of the state. And just some points to make, are the seed mixes typically contain 100 to 200 species, uh, only local wild, uh, wild ecotype seed. Our seed seedings are excellent pollinator habitat and the mixes are uniquely suited to hydrologic regimes and climate conditions, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, many of the species we collect are unavailable commercially or hard to find and very expensive if you can. Resulting plant communities have the ability to withstand floods and droughts and they exhibit dynamism and resilience within a year and between years and at the core, we are trying to preserve Nebraska's botanical heritage, starting at the genetic level, so that, again, stressing the importance of local ecotype seed. Uh, these are some examples of restored sites. Um, it's amazing to see the development of these different sites over the years. Um, Due to time, I, we won't get it into it too much, uh, but generally it takes at least three to five years to see a restoration uh, start to develop some of these native plant communities that look like, that start looking like a prairie, uh, but that development takes a uh, course over a much longer period of time uh, and changes, you know, through the, this period of succession of, of different plant species that come in and hold space and fade out over time for other longer lived species. Um, so it's a very Neat process to watch and amazing to see the wildlife that comes back to some of these uh, areas that are, you know, have these native plant communities. So, you know, we're, we can't fully recreate what the native prairie was, but by creating these uh, native plant communities that are, you know, site appropriate to the hydrology um, and to the soils, as Mike mentioned, uh, we can really uh, do a pretty uh, nice job of, of you know, those species finding the right spot and selecting those spots, um, you know, whether it's a wetland reserve program project area or areas along the Central Platte Valley where you have, um, you know, this variation in uh, soils and hydrology throughout the whole site. Um, and then another additional piece to our restoration program is being able to grow uh, plugs in our greenhouse. And this began um, around uh, 2010 and helped kick off my position at Prairie Plains, um, but we have grown that um, as a part of the restoration program to offer uh, these plugs for uh, more specific, um, you know, conservation efforts uh, within restoration sites and uh, to be able to enhance some of those sites to provide uh, an even greater diversity of species at some of those sites. So I'll talk just briefly about that. Um, we have the ability to grow around 100 species or more each year, kind of depending on uh, the different projects that are going on. Um, I currently have about the capacity to do about uh, 5,000 to 6,000 um, plugs within a year uh, in our small space. Um, and they're used mostly in, in high diversity restoration uh, plantings, um, and we occasionally 
uh, have been able to use them also for educational purposes uh, in pollinator gardens and things like that. Um, but the focus is growing really on growing species that are less common um, or hard to find seed sources for uh, in restoration sites and uh, sometimes ones that also establish slower in restoration sites. Um, and we also have a high priority on, pollen, on uh, high pollinator value species and species for specific uh, conservation efforts. Um, and one example of that being uh, violet species. And uh, they're a very high priority for us for regal fritillary conservation work here in the state of Nebraska. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, the plugs play, may play an important role in enhancing restoration sites uh, with key early season forbs. Um, this is something that we've learned over time, both through observation and also uh, through research that's been done on some of our uh, restoration plantings uh, where they, they're supporting pollinator species and the native plant community is developing to have uh, really nice pollinator resources and, and diverse plant communities in the mid season and the late season. Um, but it's the early season uh, where we're lacking some of those, those uh, that floristic quality at some of those sites. Um, and that is largely due to seed source issues. So finding some of those early season species in abundance can be difficult. Um, so one thing that the greenhouse is helping us do and, and we hope uh, will we'll provide more um, you know, ability for us to uh, restore these sites is uh, by having these early season species establish. So just a little bit about the regal fritillary habitat enhancement. Um, so just a little uh, background on this butterfly. Uh, many of you know this is a species of concern uh, considered threatened in the state of Nebraska, could potentially be uh, listed. Uh, in the future, and the adult butterflies do not travel far, um, so they are tied to remnant prairie sites, uh, you know, within their, their range. And so the larvae feed, of course, on these violet species, and by growing them out in the greenhouse and putting them into restored sites um, that are adjacent to existing regal fritillary uh, you know, habitat where they, they are at at native prairies. Uh, the hope is we can expand their range. And so um, there's some research that needs to go into this that we're, we're trying to work on as well and with others uh, to understand how these plugs survive uh, in these restored sites. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the process of, of growing those too, but we use uh, parent plants um, so actually finding violets out in, you know, the native prairie uh, where they, they are very abundant and we feel safe, you know, taking maybe one or two plants from that population. Um, so going and doing that and then growing those out in pots in the greenhouse. Um, and so you can kind of see that process there uh, where then you're going to have, um, you know, these seedlings coming up in the pots from that seed spilling back into those pots. So it actually works quite well. It's very hard uh, to go out and harvest violet seed because of how small, um, you know, the seed capsule is and they burst at just the right time. Um, and so by doing it this way in the greenhouse, it allows us to get great germination um, from the seed that spills into those pots and comes up the following spring. And so we've been able to work on a few projects with uh, different partners around the state uh, to start doing this. And uh, one of those is the Prairie Corridor uh, outside of Lincoln around the town of Denton. And so we have plugged uh, violets into sites where we will uh, create these groupings for the violets, um, typically around 10 to 15 violets at each site, so within a few feet of each other. Uh, and we're trying to track survivorship at those those sites. Um, so what's been a really great uh, thing that also has allowed us to, uh, you know, be able to educate a little bit more about conservation efforts in Nebraska is that these projects also pull in a lot of volunteer uh, folks that, that help us as well. So um, we've used it as, as, a, as an educational tool as well. Um, so we're, we're just starting to track some of these sites after planting in the prairie corridor. We've predominantly planted uh, Viola pedatifida, the prairie violet, at these sites um, and, and are working on tracking those 
Um, and then also we've started projects in the Central Platte Valley uh, this fall working with the Platte River Recovery and Implementation Program um, as well as Headwaters uh, to get uh, Viola Missouriensis plugs uh, into some sites in the Central Platte River Valley. Um, so hoping to track some of those as well and, and figure that out. So there's not a lot of uh, research out there in the literature on that. Um, so hopefully being able to contribute uh, the success of planting plugs at those sites and then following up with uh, regal fritillary assessments as well. All right, so we'll hold questions till the end. All right, thank you, Sarah and Mike. Uh, our next speaker will be here in just a brief moment. So while I've got your ear for a second and I'm trying to fill the space, our options are, let's see here, I can tell jokes, um, I can sing a song or dance. Anyway. Oh, Andy's here just in time. <laughs> Whew, that was close. <laughs> okay, so we've got uh, Andy Caven. Vice President of North American Programs for the International Crane Foundation. And he's gonna be talking to us today uh, about the scientific case against the proposed downlisting of the whooping crane under the Endangered Species Act. Take it away. Let's try to decide what mic to use. Um, don't know why I'm doing two presentations, but if you saw the earlier one, it was with Melissa. So it was, it's going to be the better one. Um, so we're going to, this is going to be a little dense. I try not to put a lot of writing in slides, but much of this is narrative. And it's going to take a little bit of thinking. So I'm going to pause at times, maybe tell a few jokes, like I just flew in from California, and boy are my arms tired. Oh, thank you. So. It's going to be dense, but, but bear with me. Stop me if you want to rehash anything or ask any questions. So this is kind of an interesting thing, right? Um, I'm just going to dump right in, jump right into it here. And so I, I've blocked out any names or anything. So, so many of you know that um, there was conversations in the Fish and Wildlife Service about proposed downlisting of the whooping crane, right? So we're gonna dissect and break this down and think about it. So this is a memo that was gotten, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity, boy, they are good at FOIAs, and they've done it again. So in April, this last spring, they released um, a series of things they'd gotten through a FOIA request about whooping cranes and the potential downlisting. And this was a planned press release, fill in the date, um, from the southwest region of the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, where it was sort of going to be branded as a success story, and look at all this work we've done. You know, we're we're ready to downlist whooping cranes, um, and and we'll get into it. But it's interesting there in the International Recovery Plan, 2007, signed with Canada. Um, it, it's an international agreement, and this was going on without Canada's knowledge, which I actually know for a fact. Um, so that's kind of interesting, but we'll, we'll keep going here. And so one interesting thing is there was this press release and then there was a question and answer, and a question and answer sort of uh, full documents that are ready to release, but it, but it was stopped. So we'll keep moving here. So what, what were the criteria in the international plan toward downlisting? Let's break that down. And maybe the downlisting was warranted, but it was sort of avoided because there can be some, some pushback against such things, which, you know, makes sense. We've been working on this species a long time. We're not ready to call it threatened. Maybe we are. So let's break it down. So criteria one, maintain a, a minimum of 40 productive pairs over a period of at least 10 years, which is 160 birds in the Aransaswood buffalo population, so less than we have now, or t and 25 productive pairs with populations of 100 in at least two reintroduced populations. All three populations must be self-sustaining. So that's criteria one. We're bigger than that in Aransaswood Buffalo, but the reintroduced populations, as I'll show you, are not uh, self-sustaining yet. 
So we don't meet that one. Let's check alternative criteria 1A. Everybody keeping up? You having fun yet? Whew. All right. How can you make this stuff fun, right? I'm going to try it. So if only one additional wild self-sustaining population is reestablished, so 1A is you only got one reintroduced population working, well, then you need 400 birds in Aransas with 100 productive pairs, and um, you need at least 120 in the separate populations, and both must be self-sustaining. Again, we've passed that for the Aransas wood buffalo population, but we have not for uh, in e either reintroduced population. And as I'll show in a minute, there's been a couple of reintroduction failures as well. Um, so we're down to alternative criterion 1B. So you need to have 1,000 birds with 250 uh, productive pairs in the Aranswood buffalo population, which we have not reached. And interesting, there are no delisting criteria in the recovery plan because people thought at the time we're so far off, we may downlist, but we're definitely not going to delist. So number two. So how many cranes are there in the world? This is hot off the press. I just tallied this with uh, some colleagues. So we got the latest numbers from the Louisiana non-migratory and the eastern migratory reintroduced populations of whooping cranes. So 543 plus or minus, you know, what was it, about 150 in the um, Aranswood buffalo population, that survey. And you can see the other two are under 100. And there's about 134 in captivity, which is actually under the captivity goal, too, which is randomly set at 153, in case you wanted to know. So we don't meet the criteria. Why down list? Well, let's just stop and look at how these populations are doing. So I just tallied this, too. And this is all the cranes in the world. They're, across the 15 species, there are about 2.7 million cranes. And about 50% of them are sandhill cranes, which is pretty impressive. And you have, by far, the rarest crane is the whooping crane, the only one under 1,000. And it's listed by IUCN as endangered. The only one that's more endangered is the Siberian crane, because even though there's over 5,000 likely, they're sort of seeing a precipitous decline. And those two species are the two most wetland dependent, so that's interesting. You can see on the top, it's kind of a complicated graphic, but that is the eastern migratory population over time. And you can see the number of birds released. The total population is in black, so actually it's declining. It was up over 120 at one point. Now we're down around the high 70s. Um, but the good thing there is there's a little bit of uh, natural recruitment happening, which there wasn't before. You can see that dark green. There wasn't any dark green early on in the reintroduction. We're starting to see it. So there's positive signs, but we have not crossed that threshold yet for a self-sustaining population. In fact, we're decreasing at a pretty significant rate, so we need to introduce 10 to 15 birds a year to keep it stable. So not yet self-sustaining. In the Aranswood buffalo population, you can see the latest counts on there. Even though it seems to be increasing, there's a large confidence interval and a bit of uncertainty there. So that 543 is a point estimate, plus minus a fair amount. So have we met the criteria? It's seemingly not, but there's more. So to keep with the language, let's pause. Everybody breathe. Take a minute. All right, back to reading. So. One argument is, and I can do this without looking at it, is that actually those criteria, despite them being an internationally signed agreement with Canada, Canada does not see it this way, um, the criteria are a guideline. Don't really matter. What's important is the uh, detailed technical definition of endangered, which is means a species which is in danger of extinction throughout all or a significant portion of its range. You know, so, so the argument in the downlisting I've talked to, I had a good, uh, you know, fishing visit with one of the top uh, Fish and Wildlife Service people in Texas and we fished and talked about this. And the argument from their perspective in the Southwest region is that the whooping crane is not in danger of immediate extinction, per their opinion, which is mostly based on a population viability analysis, which doesn't really take into consideration all the threats. It sort of underestimates and underenumerates the number of threats, but that's the argument. So maybe we could see that, but below are the 
factors that can list something as endangered. So you can see here present, uh, the presence of or threatened destruction, modification, or curtailment of habitat. Well, we know that's continuing. Tar sands, Great Plains wetlands are being lost. That's been highlighted. Um, the overutilization for commercial, recreational, scientific purposes. This has actually improved quite a bit. There's limited continuation. There's quite a few shootings, especially in the reintroduced populations, but that has decreased. But disease and predation is one that's gotten worse, right? The novel pathogens, avian influenza. We had 5,000 cranes die in Israel recently from this new strain of avian influenza. That's quite scary. So I, I don't think that's gone away. And the regulatory mechanisms are kind of being weakened at the moment. So D, we haven't fixed that. And finally, natural and man-made factors affecting the species' continued existence. We actually have more of those with climate change, continued ground and surface water overappropriation, and uh, increasing ener energy infrastructure with power lines. As if you saw Amanda's talk, I don't know if she did power lines. I had to miss it. She covered that. So. So let's just take a look at the threats. Here's a visual one. Dana Varner will be presenting later this week, and I've gotten one of her paper's figures up there. You can see decreasing wetland land cover in the rainwater basins. You can see decreasing wetland land cover in the southern Great Plains and also in the northern Great Plains. So, and that is forced by climate change more problematic. So habitat and threats not going away. So, I contend we're not ready to downlist the whooping crane. This is a little technical. We can take a really deep breath. <sighs> okay. So the one way the species status assessments are a risk assessment. Will the species disappear? Done every five years. I hope I'm making this entertaining. They're, they consider the three R's, represent, uh, representation, resilience and redundancy. Now representation is about genetic, geographic, and life history variation. So I go on to say that genetically, actually whooping cranes lost, only about a third of their mitochondrial DNA is retained from pre-settlement populations. So they've lost a lot of genetics, and right now, over 100 years, they're supposed to retain 92%. So people feel pretty good about that, but they're still technically losing genetic variation. So. Also, they had a wide range, which has contracted considerably. Um, so in terms of representation and life history, uh, that's the, the representation I don't think is to a place that's that much more resilient than historically, especially because the populations, reintroduced populations aren't self-sustaining. Resilience of the species to stochastic disturbances by virtue of population growth and connectivity. So the population is increasing, but neither of these reintroduced populations are connected to the remnant population. So again, I don't think, personally, the resilience is that much higher, especially when you consider that habitat equality and, avail and availability continue to be threatened. And the population is still quite small. And ultimately that the scale of disturbance is increasing with climate change and habitat loss. Finally, redundancy, those other populations aren't self-sustaining yet, so we don't really have redundancy. So was that painful? You all doing okay? So here's the historic range, so it kind of shows how widely distributed the species was when there was maybe 10,200 years ago. You know, um, actually, it was an outlying northwesterly population of whooping cranes that survived, but they used to winter down into central Mexico, uh, you know, the southeastern coastal plain. And you can see failed reintroductions here. In fact, there are six left in Florida. It's a failed reintroduction. Gray's Lake was a failed reintroduction. And we're hoping that Louisiana and the eastern migratory population reintroductions are not failed. And there's been some natural recruitment, which makes them better than those other two, but they're certainly not a guaranteed success as of yet. So that is a very brief case against, um, and I'm missing one slide, I think. Oh, yeah, I really like this picture. 
Um, I'm not missing a slide, but I wanted to highlight this Nat Geo photo. That's in Israel where the avian influenza outbreak happened in a common crane roost area and 5,000 cranes died. So anyways, kind of scary stuff. But I think I did that pretty quickly. And um, we are working on a paper. If any of you sciencey people want to help the scientific argument against downlisting, we're working on that paper, taking co-authors. You do have to do a little work. Um, otherwise, we'll have a letter at some point. You're welcome to sign, email me. Uh, if you have any questions, find me later, I guess. Did I make it in time, I hope. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. All right, so now we've got roughly 20, 25 minutes. Um, so I'm going to ask all the speakers to come up here in the front and we've got two microphones I can go around uh, and any questions that arise um, we'll start with questions in the audience and I'll just bring the mic around for any questions out there and then um, give this one to you guys if I can not break it in the process okay so I'll give this to you guys Whoever. And we'll open it up. Questions? Start with Dana right here. So for Andy, if whooping cranes were downlisted, what would be the real world implications of that? Would that change how they allocate funding or reduction in captive breeding programs? What would, what would actually be the result? Um, yeah, there are actual, actually some, some changes in, in minute laws that would regulate that. And I certainly think the funding is the number one. Like, for instance, there's a recovery coordinator. I don't think there's any threatened species, to my knowledge, anybody in the audience can correct me if I'm wrong, any threatened species that have a recovery coordinator. We think that's a great thing uh, because it's somebody actively keeping track of all ongoing operations to support that. Um, another thing is funding. Definitely the funding is going to decrease. So, so active participation, support, and funding are probably the, the core, core differences. Um, but there's also more regulations on critical habitats um, with endangered versus threatened. And that gets a little into the weeds. And I've read it, but I'm, if I quote off the top of my head, I might be a little bit wrong. But, but ultimately, there's... A, a further process to developments on federal land um, to, to um, overseeing those when the species list is endangered as opposed to threatened. So um, yeah, so, so there's, there are some legal things. They're relatively small, but I think the funding is big. Next question from Melinda. Um, so my question, I'm not sure if it's for Sarah or for Mike from Prairie Plains, but my question has to do with attempts to sort of diversify your plant matrices or your parental plants. Do you follow genetics at all to make sure that what you're reintroducing has genetic diversity? Do you want to start? Or? I think the short answer is we try to collect seed from as many different sources as possible. And we try to vary that year to year. It, you know, we have to follow, follow the rains basically, and especially in a year like this, to find good seed. And sometimes we do end up taking seed from the same population. But there's so little left out there that's kind of what we have to resort to. Yeah, kind of by a, you know, there's certain species that we can harvest from many different locations, which we'll definitely do when we can. But other times, certain species we can only find maybe a couple populations to harvest from, so it, it depends. And, and for the greenhouse too, like with sourcing the violets, I try to go to at least, you know, maybe four to five different sites that are across, you know, anywhere from 50, 60 miles or so, um, if I can, to, to source from some different populations. So I'm, you know, hopefully representing that with what's coming out of the greenhouse as well. Got a question back here. Uh, I'm Steve Jones from Boulder Rights of Nature in Boulder County Audubon. Um, can some of you or one of you address what's going on with the groundwater resource in the rainwater basin? 
I made the unfortunate decision to stop off at the Funk Waterfowl Production Area yesterday, and it was one of the more depressing sights I've seen in many years. Is this because of irrigation, or is it because of drought, or is something else going on? People are giving it to me because I've worked around here a long time, but there's better people in the audience. Craig Davis or Dana Varner might have a good guess. Dana? <laughs> Aaron but, Hacker, too. Yeah. Um, Sarah, so, as well. I, I, you know, I've only been in this area for eight years, but, um, you know, no offense, but when we talk to older people, <laughs> they, have, they remember a very different rainwater basin situation with a lot more water. And so, um, yeah, considering... Uh, the switch to pivot irrigation is a big one that, you know, I'd say we suspect but are ne aren't necessarily sure compared to um, the, um, I can't think of what it's called, but the pipes on the ground irrigation. There you go. <laughs> so, yeah, that, that's definitely what I think is the, um, you know, the word on the street is that it, it is that switch to pivot irrigation, but we don't know for sure. It's my best guess. <laughs> Craig, you want to? Jump in. Oh, this. Okay. Where? Anyone else? Okay. Ellie, Ted LaGrange. I missed a lot of people I could have highlighted yeah. there. Anyone, anyone else want to chime in on that one? Just raise your hand if you do. Okay, we'll give it to Ted. Yeah, Dana, so I, I coordinate our wetlands program for the state and including pumping into rainwater basins. And so those are playa wetlands that are perched above the water table. So what we're seeing really right now is just mostly a result of drought. I mean, we have an extreme drought in this area and had almost no rain for, uh, we had some basins that filled with water, a couple with some thunderstorm events this summer. We've had no rain since then, they've just have dried up. So um, that's somewhat natural um, that we have that drought there. They're not, they're not connected to the groundwater directly as far as like discharge sites. The groundwater's a couple hundred feet down. So it's, uh, they're really driven by, by recent rain events. So. <laughs> well, so I've been around, I've been here around 20 years as well, I don't live here now, but um, one of the things in terms of getting more permanent water at Funk about 20 or so years ago had to do with groundwater, a mound that was building off of the canals that were there had a tremendous amount of water that was, that was actually leaking from those, those canals, irrigation canals. And so I suspect some of changing over in terms of that may also be playing, but the drought is definitely the biggest thing. Yeah. And yeah. Artificial yes, that's uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's. <laughs> um, yeah. Another follow up on that too. Um, given a lot of the restoration efforts are currently, um, you know, a number of the the basins have sedimented in and restoration efforts kind of go in and scrape off some of that sediment. Um, is there a thinking or belief that farming practices or other impacts are influencing the amount of you know, sediment entering those basins um, or buildup of organic you know, matter within the basins that's impacting ponding? In 2019, water levels in the western sand hills were the highest we've seen in 40 years. I don't know if you tried to drive Lakeside Road or Whitman Road, they, they were underwater. It was one of the wettest periods, and I think in the last century, you didn't get that water here. Is that right? Yeah, that's, uh, in, in general, I mean, um, in the Platte Valley, we have the influence of you know, hydrologic factors outside of our local area, but uh, I'd let others that work in the basins speak to that more. I, I, as a presenter, have a question for two other presenters. Is that okay? Yep, go for it. All right, I'm, I'm going to ask two of them because they're both doing great work on wet meadows, uh, Abe and Kristen. By some metrics, right, um, 
wetland indicator score, floristic quality, hydrology. Uh, what guesstimate, what percent of the wet meadows in the plat are functional? And number two, which ones seem like they're in the best condition from both your different angles? Cool, cool to have both of you on the stage. Well, I'll answer first, and I think I'll be brief. Um, I don't know what the quality is of wet meadows really beyond my study site. Something that I'd really like to do is, is amass other types of data um, and maybe also put other data that's available in the context of some of the stuff we've been looking at related to hydrology. Um, and then for the second part of that, what was the second part again? Just, just which, which, um, what struck you about the condition of some of them? What ones seem like they're really working, kind of? Oh, yeah. Um, I mean, for us, we have vegetation data across our site, stuff like floristic quality and everything we looked at. But um, I was mainly looking at hydrology of what makes a good wet meadow. And um, I, I presented that kind of trend that we saw going from upstream to downstream. And I know that there are rates of incision that that change from upstream to downstream. And I can, I can imagine scenarios where that might have an impact on the quality of wet meadows in the riparian area, but um, that's all for future studies. So it's really just speculation. <laughs> sure. Um, so I guess I'll start with, uh, <clears throat> so you asked about the functional, what percentage of, of wet meadows we think are functional currently. I guess, uh, what do you mean by functional? Because they function, right? You just mean like high quality, like function as a wetland. Function as a wetland. Okay. <clears throat> um, so that <laughs> we won't get that deep into it. I'm not gonna keep. He asked what that means. Um, <clears throat> but um, yeah, I I um, I think all the wetlands around here are impacted, right? All the all the wet meadow sites. So I've been to 79 sites up and down. So I guess my I have more data points for this, I suppose. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, within my study, I have sites that are labeled as remnant or, or relict, but even those, uh, it's interesting to see uh, some of the loss of, of, of functionality and whatnot. So, I, I don't know, maybe that's a sad thing to say, but I mean, they're all impacted by the river currently. So, we don't have anything really existing, I would say, that is as functional as uh, historic wet meadows, maybe would have been. Uh, in terms of, uh, the second part of the question was? <laughs> <laughs> what, but both of you, you both didn't answer it. What percent of them are functional wetlands still on, on the plat? Like from what you looked at, even out of your subset of sites, how many of them would you say had predominantly wetland land cover? Oh, the percent of wetland cover? Yeah, like how, how many of the sites you looked at had predominantly wetland land cover? Predominant? Not, none of the sites, um, okay, I test, I predicted what cover would be there uh, and, and only did that at two sites, really. So, Just Binfield. Binfield and Fox, yeah. So, I would predict that a much higher percentage exists at Crane Meadows, po probably something like 60% or something, but not 100 I stumped them. It's okay. Well, it's a tr it's a tricky question. Um, hmm. I'd also add that a wet meadow isn't just wetland vegetation, right? It's the oh. the combination of those four vegetation types and some mix of them uh, has probably are always existed at wet meadow sites. That topographic variability translates to moisture variability, translates to vegetation variability. Sorry, I'm trying to go through all my sites in my head to get an exact like percentage. Um, I would say among my sites, it's pretty low, but there are some decent areas. Like as you know, on Mormon, there's some pretty cool wet meadows there. Um, it's difficult. I focused a lot so far on the invertebrate side of things. Um, so in terms of like vegetative cover and whatnot, I mean, you would have a better idea of that. I would put the percentage low in my sites. <laughs> um, let's see. Ain't it been feeling? I won't torture you with any more. Yeah, I, I do. I do. I do twenty percent actually. That's where my estimate would be currently, uh, of my sites. 
So how much of an area on a site has to be dominated by like wetland or wet meadow plant plants for it to be considered a wet meadow? Because sometimes there's like wet meadow plants on a site in like a lower area and uh, just kind of wondering like how much of it needs to be dominated for it to be classified as that? Well, that is a big question for us as well, actually. Um, but uh, I would say, so it's, it's uh, the wet meadows we, you can find in different areas, right? So we talk about this ridge swale complex we have within uh, uh, you know, the Central Platte River Valley. But the, the like, elevation of those swales and of those ridges can really impact what it is. So the swale might be a wet meadow at some points, or maybe it's a shallow marsh further down. And because of that, you get this mosaic of, of you know, different land cover types. And it led to some difficulties in terms of sampling for my study because you know, we're doing these linear strips. Well, the wet meadows aren't always linear. Right, and they do have these little humps maybe in the middle where it's like, oh, we peak up just into upland a tiny bit, and then it goes back down on the other side. And um, so, what percentage needs to be covered for? Oh, did you want to? Oh, uh, I think that was the end of my thoughts on that. <laughs> Ted's got some thoughts think, here. We're gonna. Oh, sorry. Well, Kristen, you go ahead. I'll be really brief and say that that's one of the reasons we're doing these studies is that we don't have these types of management targets and there's so much spatiotemporal variability that every year might look different and every location and every specific wet meadow track looks different. But once we can kind of collect more data and understand the, that range of sites, we can start to say, well, this site really isn't doing most of the things that we expect a, meadow to, a wet meadow to do, and, and this is maybe the minimum of what we would expect a wet meadow to do. So, so part of our interest in research is really to coming up with those answers because they don't exist currently, to my knowledge. And And, and I, I was going to add, just, just there was a great question because, and was going to follow up with your question, Andy, because when you say what's wetland, I mean, there is a definite definition of a wetland from a federal and a state law perspective on uh, meeting the hydric vegetation criteria, looking at the plant indicator status is one of the three things that needs to be met. So, and, and so sometimes when you say what's wetland, people think obligate wetland plants, you know, sedges and rushes and things, but but many of our prairie plants also have wetland indicator status and potentially if they're dominant on a site or add up to a, a number of species that, that make up dominance that can be still that can be a wetland. So there's a definite definition of wetland if you do your plant data and collect hydrology and soil data to tell whether it's wetland or not. So it's not a subjective measure in that sense if you follow the delineation protocol and the all the plants have an indicator status so but then the question is what's it function how wet was it historically is it drier wetland now than a wetter wetland and you can get into that argument but there are there are some some lines that can be drawn there by following pro procedures so yeah i, I want to i want to second ted this has been fascinating so, sorry for bogarting the questions but i wanted to see what these two said and you know, you know for me uh, uh there's hydric soil and and plant indicators and a wet meadow to me is a subtype of palustrine wetland per many per many classification schemes and so it, you know um where a lowland prairie would would be just sub irrigated prairie so so to me it's um um you have to have a significant expanse of of systems with a wetland indicator score under three or three point two a large expanse of that that pad, paddock should have that, and as well as a large percentage of hydric soil indicators like redox and clay layer and and organic matter so so i I personally think that unless it has um, a significant portion like thirty or forty percent uh, wetland wetland dominated land cover per a wetland classification it, it's probably not a functioning wet meadow in my opinion but it would be really interesting to know how many of the wet meadows meet that criteria what the i guess like my understanding is that um, a lot of wet meadow sites are much drier than they used to be, and it's possible that this archetypal 
wet meadow that we're striving for possibly exists in, in very, very few places. And I don't know, maybe that means there's no, there's less wet meadows, or maybe it means the definition of a wet meadow is changing, or I don't know. But yeah, interesting. I think there's less wet meadows. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's definitely less west, wet meadows. While we're, we're on that topic, I'll uh, read the q and I've got here online. Uh, this one's for Kristen. What impact did the Kearney Hike Bike Trail have on the hydrology of your restored site, and how was that effect applied to the hydrology and decision-making throughout other sites? So our site was just downstream of that trail, um, down gradient, downstream, and... Uh, um, that's a good question. So to really answer that, you would need a 3D groundwater model. Um, and I would assume that that path is compacted and so it has lower hydraulic conductivity. There might be water that's mounding on the other side. Um, and so that would definitely be interesting to look at. Um, it, it doesn't go right through the site, so it didn't impact the topography on our site. And so I don't have a great answer for that question because I don't you. have a 3D so, model. Yep. So fair to say then that in addition to the river groundwater levels and, and those hydrology factors, there's infrastructure factors throughout the central plot as well. That Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I think we're sitting here at about 256. So to make sure everyone can get to the next site, I think we'll go ahead and close it off. Thank you to all the speakers here today, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your day.